Commercial aviation worships consistency. Automation handles millions of flights while pilots caffeinate and monitor. But then there is the descent into one of aviation's greatest paradoxes. Airports so compromised by design, even veteran captains dread them. Midway's icy 6,500-foot runway can turn every winter touchdown into a math problem where friction disappears and braking distance evaporates. Southwest Flight 1248 proved there is no margin for error. Why do these critical airports defy every safety norm? And how do pilots survive environments where a simple miscalculation means the difference between a safe stop and disaster? It starts with the urban straitjacket, where concrete, not mountains, tests the limits of flight. Chicago Midway's runways are a throwback. 6,500 feet of pavement boxed in by neighborhoods, built when propeller airplanes ruled the skies, and a DC-3 could stop short with room to spare. Today, those same strips host loaded 737s and A320 aircraft, jets that need every foot when the weather turns against them. In winter, Midway becomes a friction experiment. The numbers are blunt. A single layer of ice or slush can slash runway grip by half. What looks like a solid landing distance on paper vanishes as soon as the wheels touch down and the brakes bite into a surface that is more skating rink than runway. Every touchdown here is a calculation in real time. Pilots check their approach speeds, landing weights, and the latest braking action reports, knowing that if they float even a few hundred feet past the threshold, the margin for error is gone. The Southwest Flight 1248 accident in December 2005 proved this in the worst way. That 737 touched down nearly halfway down the runway with snow on the pavement. The crew had just over 4,000 feet left to stop a jet weighing more than 70 tons. The brakes and reverses could not overcome the loss of friction. The plane slid off the end, crossed a busy avenue, and hit parked cars. One life lost, dozens shaken. The NTSB report spelled it out. The combination of a late touchdown and poor braking left no room for recovery. In the cockpit, winter landings at Midway are a ritual of tension. A Czech airman once said, you land here in December, you do not think about the city, you think about the brakes. Maintenance logs back him up. Repeated landings in snow and ice push brake temperatures into the red. Pilots watch the indicators spike, knowing the hardware is cooking beneath their feet. There is no grassy runoff, no engineered arrestor beds, just concrete, chain link, and the city beyond. Every knot above target speed, every foot past the touchdown zone, gets tallied against the stopping distance. When everything works, the tires screech, the reverses roar, and the jet stops with daylight to spare. But when physics takes over, there is nowhere left to go. That is the midway compromise, commerce jammed into a square mile with winter waiting to erase the numbers. San Diego's runway sits wedged between the city and the bay, but it is not the length that gets your attention. It is the approach. Final descent into San Diego is not a gentle glide. It is a controlled dive over downtown, clearing the last ridge and dropping toward the threshold at an angle that makes even seasoned pilots grip the yoke a little tighter. The standard three-degree glide path does not cut it here. Pilots fly a steeper profile, sometimes nudging four or five degrees just to clear terrain and obstacles. The parking garage at the end of runway 27 is infamous. From the cockpit, it flashes by close enough to read car models. From the cabin, passengers sometimes swear they could count license plates. The margin for error is measured in feet, and the sensation is pure compression, city, concrete, and jet, all converging in the same narrow band of air. Automation gives up early on this approach. Below 300 feet, the autopilot is out, and it is all hand flying. The descent rate is higher than usual, and the window to flare, the transition from descent to level flight before touchdown, is squeezed into the last 60 feet above the runway. Get it wrong, and the jet either floats long or pounds the pavement. There is no time to finesse. A Southwest captain once put it this way, you know you are in San Diego when the garage fills your windshield and you are not sure if you are landing or parking. The approach demands a level off that feels more like threading a needle than flying a jet. 
Stabilized approach criteria get rewritten on the fly, visual cues replace instrument cross-checks, and the pilot's hands are the last line of defense. Every touchdown here is a sensory event. The sudden brightness of concrete, the blur of the garage, the jolt of the flare, and then the tires grabbing asphalt with a screech that echoes off the terminal. The reverses open, the brakes grab, and the city exhales. San Diego does not care if you are a rookie or a thousand-hour captain. On this runway, everyone earns their landing every single time. Reagan National isn't just an airport. It is a test of nerve where the rules of geometry and politics slam together at 150 knots. The Potomac River visual approach is not marked by mountains or skyscrapers, but by a corridor of forbidden airspace. The P-56 zone draws a hard red line over the White House and the Capitol. Drift left, even by a few hundred feet, and you are in the no-fly zone. The Secret Service does not wait for explanations. Controllers are on a hair trigger, one call, one correction, and the approach is over. The Yeppesen plate for KDCA spells out the minefield, follow the river, stay centered, and do not improvise. There is no straight in descent. The Potomac bends and twists, and so does your flight path. At about 1,500 feet, the autopilot is out. From here, it is all hands. The river becomes your lifeline, and the margin for error shrinks with every second. At 300 feet above the ground, the moment arrives. The river takes a final turn, and so must the jet. Pilots roll into a 25 to 30 degree bank, lining up with runway 19 in a maneuver that is part air show, part survival drill. There is no room for drift. The stabilized approach window is barely 60 seconds wide. Lateral error is not theoretical. Controllers have terminated approaches for less. The urgency in the tower's voice is unmistakable. Turn now, stay in the corridor. Every crew briefs the same threat, do not cross the line. The P-56 boundary is invisible but absolute. One slip left and you are not just off course, you are a headline. The approach demands precision, discipline, and a steady hand. Passengers might see the monuments and the water below, but up front, the only view that matters is the corridor on the chart and the numbers on the altimeter. Touchdown at Reagan is a relief you feel in your bones. The tires screech, reverses roar, and the city's political heartbeat thumps just beyond the fence. The system worked this time, but every arrival here is a reminder. At DCA, the airspace is the enemy, and the only way through is by flying the line exactly as drawn. Madeira's runway does not just cling to the edge of the Atlantic, it juts out over the water, perched on 180 concrete pillars that tower up to 72 meters above the surf. The original strip was barely enough for a turboprop. Now, thanks to this engineering gamble, jets like the A321 and 737 can thread the needle between mountain and sea. But the fix created its own monster, a wind trap that pilots call the most unpredictable in Europe. Atlantic winds slam into the cliffs above the airport, then tumble down in violent, swirling rotors. One moment you are riding a steady headwind. The next, the air drops out from under you. Wind shear reports from the tower show downdrafts and gusts that can swing 20 knots in seconds. The most critical zone is right above the runway. Within 100 feet of touchdown, the sink rate can spike, forcing pilots to jam the throttles or abandon the approach entirely. Flying into Madeira means flying sideways. Pilots crab into the crosswind, nose pointed upwind to keep the jet tracking straight. But you cannot land in a crab. At about 200 feet, the real work begins. The pilot times a sharp rudder kick, just enough to swing the nose straight, but not so soon that the wind grabs the tail and throws you off center line. Too late, and the main gear lands at an angle. Too early, and the jet starts drifting, tires scrubbing sideways across the concrete. The margin for error is measured in seconds, and the runway is waiting, half over land, half over open water. This is where simulator champions get sorted from the real-world survivors. Airlines restrict Madeira operations to specially trained crews. The approach plate is filled with wind limits. 15 knots from the wrong direction and the airport is effectively closed. 
But even on a calm day, the wind can shift in the time it takes to call minimums. A tap captain once put it bluntly, you do not land at Madeira, you negotiate. Every touchdown is a handshake with physics, sometimes gentle, sometimes bone jarring. When the tires finally thump onto the pier, the reverses roar, and the Atlantic wind howls beneath the pillars, the only thing left is the pilot's pulse catching up to the airplane. Aspen's runway sits at 7,820 feet above sea level, but that is just the starting point for the trouble. On a warm summer day, density altitude often climbs past 10,000 feet, meaning the airplane behaves as if it is landing on a mountaintop, not a runway. The lift equation does not care about ticket prices or ski season. Lower air density means the wings generate less lift and the engines produce less thrust. A737 that needs 130 knots indicated on final is actually moving 150 or 160 knots over the ground just to stay flying. That extra speed translates directly into a longer landing roll, 30% or more added to the distance, even before accounting for the jet's weight. The numbers force hard decisions before the wheels ever leave the hub. Airlines slash the payload on hot days, fewer passengers, less baggage, sometimes even fuel offloads, just to make the performance charts work. Dispatchers run the calculations again and again, hunting for a margin that is not there. The runway at Aspen is long by mountain airport standards, but with thin air, every foot gets used. There is no option to land long or fast. The approach is strictly one way, land to the south and take off to the north. The surrounding terrain makes a go-around after the threshold a fantasy. If the approach is not perfect, the only safe move is to divert before committing. A Czech airman who has flown Aspen for decades puts it bluntly, you get one shot. If you try to salvage a bad approach here, you're gambling with granite. The cockpit briefing always ends with the same line, know your numbers. When the tires finally touch, the brakes and reverses work overtime while the altimeter still reads higher than most mountain peaks. At Aspen, physics writes the rules, and the penalty for getting them wrong is written in stone. Tonkontin does not wait for mistakes. The airport sits in a valley carved tight into the hills above Tegucigalpa, with a runway just over 6,500 feet long and mountains closing in on every side. On approach, the autopilot is gone, and the descent becomes a hand-flown, visual exercise in geometry. There is no straighten option. Pilots fly past the airport, then hug the ridgeline, watching the altimeter and the terrain through the windshield. At roughly 800 feet above the city, the real test begins. A sweeping turn often banked past 45 degrees, with the ground close enough to count rooftop water tanks. The runway only appears at the last moment, demanding a rollout that is more fighter jet than airliner. Every inch of the turn is a balancing act. Too shallow, and you miss the alignment. Too steep, and you risk sinking too fast or scraping a wing. The margin for error is measured by the width of the valley and the height of the hills. A go-around here is not just a missed approach, it is a race against the terrain. The climb gradient needed to escape the bowl is punishing, especially at high weights or on hot days. Most pilots brief the approach with a single mantra. If the turn is not perfect, do not try to salvage it. Divert or try again. Ton Contin does not forgive improvisation. A Central American captain once said, you look left and see people hanging laundry. You look right and see the hillside. Then the runway snaps into view and you are already banking hard. The touchdown comes fast, with the tires grabbing concrete and the brakes earning their pay. For a few seconds, the city is silent, waiting to see if the jet will stop before the end of the pavement. At Tonkontar, every landing feels like threading a needle with a 737. One shot, no second chances. Paro is the end game. The airport sits in a Himalayan valley boxed in by peaks that scrape 18,000 feet. There is no radar vectoring, no ILS, no autopilot to save the day. The approach is a winding descent through mountain passes where the walls close in and the only navigation is a sequence of visual checkpoints 
memorized in training. For the first part of the approach, the runway is a rumor, hidden behind rock and forest, invisible until the last half minute. Pilots descend to 12,000 feet, banking left and right, tracking headings by compass and terrain alone. At 5,000 feet, the aircraft is still weaving between ridges, nose pointed at green slopes, not concrete. The runway finally appears out of nowhere, a strip of pavement that looks impossibly short and impossibly close. There is no stabilized approach here in the western sense, the descent is steep, often more than 5 degrees, and the bank angle can hit 30 or 40 degrees just to stay within the valley. Every correction is made by hands. The workload is relentless. If the airplane drifts high or low, there is no time for a go-around. The only option is to commit or escape back into the mountains. Pilots keep their hands on the throttles and their eyes outside, searching for the moment the runway reveals itself. Only about two dozen pilots in the world are certified to land here. The Czech Airman's line is legend. Paro doesn't care about your hours, it cares if you can fly. The margin for error is measured in seconds and feet. When the wheels finally touch, it is not just a landing, it is a passage earned by skill, nerve, and the willingness to trust hands and eyes over automation. At Paro, the jet is just a guest in the mountains, and the mountains never blink. Today, jet traffic keeps surging, and these airports are not getting any longer, lower, or safer. The FAA still clears over 700,000 flights a year through Midway and Reagan National alone. Proof that economics routinely outmaneuvers engineering caution. Until we build runways where nature actually allows, pilots will keep betting their careers on each approach. Sometimes, progress means landing on the edge. Share your wildest airport landing in the comments below.